Thank you, Kasteri. Thank you for this introduction and thanks a lot for all to all the organizers for this invitation to this beautiful place uh, and this this amazing school. I find it it's it's always very stimulating to have uh, giving lectures in front of so many motivated young people. Um, so my my talk is about uh, what I call precision spectroscopy of trapped charge particles because I will not only talk about ions. Um, but um, I will also talk about, and I will not, well, I will talk a bit about spectroscopy, but I will mainly talk about tools uh, because, and, and talking about trapping of charged particles, because this is the main underlying technique in order to do precision spectroscopy. And as I understood, you already had some introduction about laser cooling. You had introductions about clocks and about quantum metrology, about precision spectroscopy. You will have another, another uh, or other lectures about clocks, which are a lot based on these things. So my, uh, my lectures will be maybe a bit more fundamental in a certain sense, uh, talking about the really uh, fundamental in the sense that they will talk about really um, the, the, the trapping of charged particles. Uh, and I also have to give credit to some of uh, my colleagues uh, whom I stole slides off or maybe uh, based things on their slides. Um, so before starting, uh, I just let me introduce the, the place I come from. If it will work. It, oh, there is a, sorry. This is the place where my university is. It's called Marseille. It's in southern France, and it's a very nice place to see. But it's hot in summer, and Bangalore is much better. It's much nicer and uh, with a cool breeze. So, but still, it's a very beautiful place to live. Um, so the outline of my talk is very long. You see, there's many things. Um, I will see. I think I today I will get somewhere about somewhere around here about trapping and modified traps. And uh, talking tomorrow, but maybe a bit more about punning traps. I will talk uh, a lot about quadrupole traps. So what is a quadrupole trap? What do you use for that? And I had a very nice introduction this morning by Dima already, who told you all the, or some of the amazing things you can do with ion traps or accelerators, which are very close. And so I will talk about storage of trap particles. And you will see that there's things, there's many things you can do um, using either light or no lasers. Um, and so I will talk mainly today about um, uh, about um, about uh, radio frequency traps and tomorrow, well, let's say maybe today about radio frequency traps and tomorrow about panning traps, what we see where we get and, and how we get there. And I will start, try to discuss some of the, the fundamental experiments going along the way. And I will start with an historical introduction, which I like a lot, because um, it's trapping and manipulating something is uh, an idea which goes far back. There is a famous German natural philosopher, because by the time you were neither physicist nor chemist nor whatever, you were a natural philosopher. And, and this Georg Christoph Lichtenberg has had some sort of, he, he wrote notes and notes and notes, books of notes. And, and in one of his notes, he said, I believe that it's very sad that in all our chemistry, even that he said in all our chemistry, we are not able to freely suspend the elementary constituents. And I think this is a very nice idea of, 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 I mean, you see that how far back it goes, that if you want to study something, you want to isolate this something freely suspended, no interaction with the environment, and just, just be able to study this something, this constituent. And as you will see in the following, there are ways to have this, have manipulate, store an, an elementary constituent and control it, study it, almost without interaction with the environment. Um, and so, well, this is, like I said, why would you want to trap something? Why would you want to use something like uh, um, a trapping method or an isolation method? Is that you want, if you want to study uh, a particle or whatever, a, a something, a constituent, then you want to look at it at a, for a long time. 
you want to uh, to be it at the same place, so that you can make your observation, you can make a, a maybe a control of something of a parameter, and you want it to be without interaction with the environment, so that you can really look at only the particle or the constituent you want to have. And then you want to have also something of a reproducible setup that you want, if you want, if you do that one day, you want to do it the next day and maybe continue your observation or uh, go on and have uh, something, make a comparable, uh, a comparison experiment. And so uh, this is something, this trapping something is an idea which has been around for a long while and which is the basic or one of the basic methods in physics. And today we use a number of methods you have heard in the last week and you know about a number of different methods as to how to trap neutral particles and today I will talk about how to trap charged particles in a certain sense and how we do that. So what we have today is I will talk in my talk I will I in my two lectures I will concentrate on what, what we call quadruple traps and I will introduce how they work and, and why are they quadruple what is so special about them and why do we use them. But today these quadruple traps they're able to store charged particles any charged particle okay from starting from the electron to large proteins. As long as that charge, okay, a protein plus, uh, uh, we can go to antimatter, we can go to micro diamonds or color centers, uh, and we can even trap dust particles or whatever you want, uh, as long as the particle is charged. Um, we can charge particles of different charge to mass ratio, be it one or be it uh, one over a million, okay, so there's a large. Um, a large, uh, um, a large interval of that, and then a sizable system. What we can do is today is we can in the traps that we're talking about. I will not talk about accelerators, but there are things which are very close in accelerators, and the the the, the methods which are very close. And if you go normally to higher densities, in the traps I will be talking about, you go to let's say a billion ions maximum. Okay, that depends on the size of the trap, but you can go to from one. Two billion I, and that is that means that you can really work with different orders of magnitude and work with different system sizes, and this is why this is very interesting also as as study systems because you're going to one to ten to a hundred I and all also see evolutions in these things. And now I'm too far, and the most important thing is that we can trap them for a very long time. We can start, we can trap for a millisecond, but we can trap. For an hour, we can trap for a day, and we can trap for a year. So, and this is very, very important because trapping the same thing for a very long time allows you to look at it for a very long time and to really make fundamental experiments, uh, which are uh, which can really um, um, go to the precision. You want to, and this is what this uh, this school is about, is about precision spectroscopy. So, doing precision spectroscopy, having something which helps you to store for a very long time and be able to look at it and to probe something for a very long time is one of the basics of precision spectroscopy, and really um, something of, of an important ingredient in, in what you, what we're looking at. And in all these traps, we can do that with very high control. We can tune the distance between ions. We can have that in vacuum. And if that's in cryo, we go to a vacuum to 10 to the minus 17 millibar. There are various cooling methods. We can address single particles. So there's very, we have a very high control of these particles that we trap. And I think this is one of the, one of the, the advantages of these traps and which can help us to really do these precision spectroscopy experiments that we will so th these quadrupole traps I will introduce, they're used today for many, many things. I mean, you've heard uh, this morning something about action, action search. They are used for action research. They are used for these approaches in millicharge particles. Uh, they are used for many mass spectrometry experiments uh, to very high precision. Um, they're used for G-factor measurements. They're used for the production and control of antimatter. They use for quantum information, for frequency metrology. You've heard about atomic clocks, and you will hear, hear even more. 
and they're used for a range of fundamental atomic and molecular spectroscopy applications for things we call cold chemistry, which are about reaction rates and collisions. Um, we can make what we call a non-neutral plasma, one component plasma in, in such a trap, in these traps and these sort of traps. And we can even store macroscopic particles. This is coming up more and more like enemy senders, for example. And we can even use them for outreach experiments. One of the, these famous things uh, for of these ion traps is to make a trap with just a, a sort of a, a needle and you can just trap ions in the in free air if you want to. So uh, in, uh, the, the basics of all these uh, of all these applications is how to trap them, how to manipulate them. And this is very historic, so I'm sorry, the resolution is not very good, but this is from the Nobel Prize, uh, and I will talk a bit about, uh, about who got that Nobel Prize later, but just to introduce the first introduction about the Paul and Penning traps, or what I call the quadruple traps, and I will go into details later. These are these devices which, are, which have this quadruple form, a quadruple shape having two end caps, one end cap and a ring. Okay, and so there are two ways of trapping charged particles in these devices, either by applying a rapidly varying uh, radio frequency field uh, to create a temporal potential minimum. So just to, to have these charged particles inside there. Uh, and the other one is what we call a panning trap is by applying in the Z axis of this same trap, um, a magnetic field and the magnetic field will force the ions or the, the charged particles to make a, a, a rotating movement around these B field lines. And then we only have to apply DC voltage on the end caps in order to keep them. So these, these traps I will talk about and you will, I will talk with better resolution and in detail about these traps. They are really, they share the same thing. They share the sh same idea, the, sh uh, tr the the, the, the shape of the trap also, which follows the equipotential lines, and I will, you will see that later on. Um, we can have um, particles in, the, in there, which have a normally uh, an energy about an electron volt, but we can cool down to very low temperatures. We look at things uh, normally, which are uh, below a millimeter, maybe a square millimeter squared, and we can look at them. You see, this is already an old, this is from the Nobel Prize in 89. This is an old slide that says uh, duration of observation 100 seconds, but today it's, well, easily a year or let's say a couple of months. So the, the two people who are the, the, the pioneers, I would say, of trapping are called Wolfgang Paul and Hans Demert. Not penning, no? okay. So we talk about the Paula and the penning trap, but uh, we, we would the, the, the person who was the pioneer for the Paul trap is Wolfgang Paul, and that's the person that's somebody who worked on mass filters and who worked on accelerators, okay. And what he did on accelerators, he was trying to. Uh, Paul was was thinking of an idea of um, focusing the beam uh, spatially, spatially focusing a beam, strong focusing for a synchrotron, okay? That was the, the, the thing he worked on, okay? And you will see that the, the trap he has invented and which, uh, which has taken his name is, is the byproduct of that because this trap is the temporal translation of what he was inventing on a spatial scale. He was really thinking about focusing, focusing, defocusing, and what the trap does is the same thing, being at the same at the same location, but doing that in a temporal way, uh, focusing, defocusing. And if you have that in the same place, apply the field in the same place, you can really use that in order to store ion. And all the all the that, that was a German guy, and all Germans know that the first publication is in a very bizarre journal, which is a journal of the Ministry of Industry and and economy of, of a regional of a region in Germany. And that's the first publication. Don't try to look for it. It's the, the, well, I think you can find it, but it will be in German. So this is maybe hard to get, but I know that Fritz is already saying yes, because he has it and I have it. And, uh, and, and so um, uh, this is the first, uh, the, the first publication and it's called 
an iron cage. What he said is put the ions in a cage, keep them in a cage, keep them at the same, at uh, keep them as the lions in a cage in order to look at them. Uh, and so, uh, and if we talk about punning traps, the, the punning trap itself was, was invented or was developed by Hans Demert. Uh, and Hans Demer was using some ideas that uh, Franz Penning has developed uh, in the early 1930s about when he was talking about the Panning Gorge. You might have heard about the Panning Gorge, you have learned about that. And so, um, um, and Hans Demer has used some ideas of, of Penning, and then he has given the name of Penning to this trap. Uh, and and has really said, okay, this is what I with these ideas of penning, which I continue to develop. I will I will coin that the, the penning trap, the, the penning trap, which uses magnetic fields in order to um, in order to store the, the charged particles. Okay, these are these two people, Demet and uh, so Demet and Paul and Demet and Paul have shared in eighty nine. Uh, half of the Nobel Prize for the development of the iron trap technique because they have made really fundamental contributions to that set of things uh, in a first in a first step by uh, for mass, mass spectrometry or mass filtering um, and you will see that today well there are many other applications to that but that was their first idea and then Demir was very pioneering for all this atomic spectroscopy things as we will go along the way, you will see it along the way. And the other, and the other half, oops, sorry, I'm too fast. Oops, can I come back? No, I cannot. I can, I can only go forward. I can, can I go back? No, 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 no. I have to do this. I will come back. Okay, so, and, and the other half of that Nobel Prize was for Norman Ramsey for this, this uh, as, um, ha, um, his, uh, his method of oscillating uh, separated fields. And of course, you all know about that. And the iron trap has made it even into a museum. So this is one of the first, or one of, it's a particular iron trap which has set up for Paul and which is in, there's a part of the German museum, which is in Bonn and it's about iron trapping because Paul was in Bonn. And so there's a very famous iron trap. And there's many things on this on the on the website of the Nobel Committee where there's also a poster, and it will make some publicity about a school we have we are making with in particular Niels Madsen and Richard Thompson, and we do that every three years, and it's a tiny bit like here but different, <laughs> and so we have also written some proceedings on that, and there are some tutorials. On that. Okay, so uh, let's start about the real, about the physics of the traps then, after this historical introduction. Um, and I will, um, well, I will start trapping particles with the field. I mean, you know, all know about that. You might have heard about Ernstron theory, which, uh, which says that in principle, um, with only electrostatic fields, you cannot trap charged particles, because um, you, if you want to trap particles and you want to create a 3D potential minimum, you have to fulfill these expression. But if you take Laplace to that, then you will see that, um, it, it, that it requires that the parameters A plus B plus C uh, um, sum up to zero, which they don't do uh, in something like that, okay, with electrostatic potential. So you have to work around that and try to how you overcome Einstein theory theorem, and and there are two solutions to that. One is, as I said before, one is to add a magnetic field, and to the electrostatic trap, and and have this um, um, and 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 force the the particle to be on a circular orbit around the magnetic field lines. And the other one is to use oscillating fields. That means to change your fields all the time in order to overcome this problem with the electrostatic fields. So if you change your, um, if you change your, um, your trapping field uh, uh, in a regular way, and you should maybe I should start with the next slide. If you change your, your trapping field and it's very simple, the approach, okay? You see that uh, you trap a particle. If you have an, an, a positive ion in there and then you have your end caps, 
here and the ring around there that you see at the time t is zero, uh, this particle will be attracted to the ring. And if th at the next instant you change the polarity of the field, then your particle will be attracted uh, not to the ring but to the end caps. Okay. And so if you change if you if you change this oscillating field or this field, the polarity of the field fast enough then the particle will make a certain motion between the, the electrons that it can never escape if ever you can you are fast enough and changing your field. And if I come back to that, so what you do there finally is you will create a minimum, but this is a minimum in time, okay? So you have, you can see this field which I just uh, described as, oh, I always, sorry. You can see it as a rotating saddle, okay? You, at, a, at a certain moment, you your potential is like that. And then the next moment, it will be like that, okay? And if your saddle rotates rapidly enough, the, the, the iron you put inside can never escape because it will always see a wall, okay? So this is the potential that finally you create. You have this, this saddle point rapidly moving uh, and then um, if you if you want to have so you have a harmonic potential okay and um, if you want to realize that with a real electrode where it, with will which will realize the the equipotentials of that of that trapping field uh, then you will normally go to these hyperbolic shape okay because this is how you how you can materialize the equipotentials of that field, okay? And so you will, the trap is then, the trap you are creating is like that, has this very bizarre form, which is not spherical. This is the, the, the real, the, the fundamental theoretical approach of a quadrupole trap. In such, a, in such a field, you can have, you can write down the equation of motion, okay, for this potential, which you apply, which is normally the oscillating field and in general, in the Paul trap, what you do is also you, you add another static field, which you could put to zero if you would want to. Okay, what's really trapping is the 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 oscillating field, and for some reasons, what I show you later on, uh, you will normally have um, uh, a static field added to that. But um, you, as I said, it can be zero. Okay. So if you apply this to you have this quadruple, this hyperbolic form. You will apply this potential, and then what you can what you can derive is that you the, the motion of the particle in this field will be described by the Mathieu equation. The Mathieu equation is what I've written down here. Okay, this is the the really the approach uh, in the three directions of how a trap a charged particle evolves in the potential that I've shown. Uh, and uh, fortunately, there has been a very smart guy a long time ago who was called Emile Mathieu. And Emile Mathieu has worked on this Mathieu equation. And that's very nice because we don't, we just can use all the things he has done, even though he published in French, I'm sorry about that. But, um, but there are many people working about the Mathieu equation afterwards. And what you see in the potential I've given you um, if you want to describe the motion of the single particle, you can solve this Mathieu equation with these two parameters, which are A and Q, okay? And what's important about these parameters, A and Q, if you write them down, okay, is the following thing. Um, the, the stability of the solution, though, this, this, this equation is solved, uh, has a stable solution for these parameters. And these parameters, if you look at them, what they contain is, the charge to mass ratio E over N. They contain either the static voltage applied or the oscillating field applied, the amplitude of the oscillating field applied. They contain uh, this value of omega. Omega is the frequency of the, of the oscillating field that you apply, okay? So what you have in this, in these two parameters for stable solution are all parameters that you choose for your trap, okay? Well, you, you might start by choosing E over M, okay? This is the, the particle you want to use, you want to work on if you want to work with an electron uh, or with a positron or with uh, uh, a large um, molecular ion, okay? So this is what you choose. And all the other parameters is how you design your trap, okay? 
it's its dimension it's the 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 trap field the trapping field that you apply and so the, this stable solution is all in our hands that's the that's the real good control we have of the particles in the trap and how we can how we can use it and another important thing is also this describes really the 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 motion of the particle in that trap and so today what we can do we can very nicely simulate all the particles that we trap and really follow them up um, uh, as good as we want to. The, the parameters that uh, these A and Q parameters, um, they, they, are, they are in a given range huh? in order to, to, like I said, you, you can choose them. And as, of course, if you want to have a stable solution for your material equation, you want to, to be a, stable in A and Q. And so you have to look in all directions, in, in your X and Y directions, in your Z directions. And so you have an overlap of those different stable regions. Uh, and so you can define for the quadruple traps, for the radio frequency trap, you can define a stable region where everything is stable, like there's one just close to zero here, then there are other stability regions which are further off. And for experimental reasons, for choosing parameters, for practical reasons, um, I would say like 99.99% uh, .99 of all people work in this first stability diagram because that's the, the easy way to produce things. And so uh, we work in this zone close to zero. And if you zoom on this zone close to zero, you see here, you have this stability diagram where you can trap uh, ions stably um, as a function of the A and Q parameters, either in the R or in the Z, in the Z direction. And uh, this, is the, this will just uh, draw out a, a parameter space where you can stably trap. And what you see also, and this is the first application, spectroscopy application, is you see that these, as I said before, these parameters depend on E over M, okay, on, on the charge to mass ratio. And so, so the stability diagram will not be the same for particles with different charge to mass ratio because, and this is, was the main reason for setting up these traps, it's a mass filter. That's the, the very first thing the traps are used for is as a mass filter, okay? And you can filter, you see that there are, here are, this is only the upper part of the diagram, but you see that four different charge to mass ratios or mass to charge ratios in this, in this thing, you will see that for different masses, you have different, uh, you have different diagrams. And this is, um, if you have, um, if you have a collection of ions in a trap, you can ramp up your field, for example, and as, um, as uh, every, every charge to E over M ratio has a different stability diagram, you can just choose, you can look at what stays uh, in your trap for certain values. And this is just a very simple, but very precise mass filter. And as such, it is used in many things. Those of you who are experimentalists, have maybe an RGA on your experiment, a residual glass analyzer. Many of today's mass spectrometers are ion traps. Okay. Um, now, if we go if we go further into that and look of the into the frequency of motion of the trap, as I, as I said before, the, the the this radio frequency field will will um, force the ion to make a certain movement in the trap, and so there are frequencies of motion. And there are the exact solutions to the Mathieu equation. You see that the exact solutions are already a bit more complicated. Uh, there can be, I mean, that, but they can be calculated with precision. Okay, so it, if we can say the secular motion, the motion of frequency of the of the ion trap is is a small omega, then this can be calculated from the trapping frequency uh, with this better parameter. And you see this beta parameter is a very long iteration, but it can be calculated, okay? It's maybe not straightforward, but it can be calculated. But um, one of the, the main um, uh, simplifications that Hans Demert has made uh, already very early in the in the science trapping business 
is that has he made what he calls an adiabatic approximation. That means in a small range of the parameter space where the ions are, are with in the, the stability diagram, if you're close to the center for four parameters, which are not too large, um, then you can have, you can approximate this beta parameter. And this is something which is used, I would say today in many, many, many experiments, because that allows you to very easily from your A and Q parameters or from your experimental parameters to calculate the sectoral frequencies to know how the ion will behave in the trap. Uh, and what you can, how you can describe that, as I said before, there is the secular motion, the, the frequency of motion of the ion in the trap. Huh? That's what we call the small omega. So there is this motion in the, in the field of a particle of a certain mass. And superimposed on that is what we call the micro motion. It's the driven motion of the trap by the trapping field. Okay, it's, it's the motion which is which is driven by this uh, uh, large omega value, which is the, the, the trapping field. So we have we do have a secular motion and superimposed the micro motion, the driven motion in the field. And this is one already, well, this is the, the fundamental operation of the trap, and this is one of the Drawbacks also of the trap. You will see that we will see that later on. This micro motion, this driven motion, is the mo most difficult motion to control in the trap because it's a driven motion. We cannot cool it by laser cooling. We can cool the secular motion. We cannot cool the driven motion. And this is the thing which is, which is, what is the, the most difficult thing to handle in the traps because this is something which comes from the trapping field and if you want to trap, well, we have to have this trapping field. So it's, there are things we have to work around these micro motion issues in order to uh, be able to, to, to see, if, to, to be able to control them. Um, if we look at the solution of the, these equation of motion, what you will see is that, as I said, you have this normal secular motion, um, uh, with a certain amplitude, okay, and we can also cool this amplitude. There is no problem around that. It depends on on the energy of 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 the ion in the trap, and we have this 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 uh, this superimposed micro motion, and and what we can see is that in our potential, in the harmonic potential, um, the, the the amplitude of the ion is increasing when it when it goes off the center, okay? The further the ion is, is away from the center, it means that the, from this harmonic potential, which is zero only in the middle, only in the central part, okay? If we go off the center, then we increase the amplitude of the ion and we increase the driven micro motion with that, okay? So um, if we really want to, to have a small amplitude and the amplitude is also what gives us afterwards Doppler effects and Doppler uh, displacement. So if we want to have a very small amplitude and also a very small amplitude of driven motion, we have to be as close to the center we, as we can be in this harmonic potential. And of course, as close to the center as we can be is, uh, well, the best thing is to be at the zero point of, the, of this harmonic potential, okay? But there's only, we're working with charged particles. So there's only place for one charge particle at the center of the trap. Already, if we are two, have two particles, that's Coulomb repulsion, and there will be nobody in the center of the trap, okay? So if we want to have the minimum, of the, the smallest amplitude of motion and the minimum driven micro motion amplitude, then we have to be uh, at the center of the trap, really in the center at zero, okay, at, X, at R zero, um, in order to be able to fulfill this condition. And this is only um, possible in the normal 3D trap. This is only possible for a single ion, okay, or for a single particle. There are other ways to do that with larger strings, and I will talk about them later. But there comes one thing which is really one about the important points of the, uh, of the ion trap and why it's also so much used in precision spectroscopy. Because remember your first lecture in quantum mechanics in first year, I don't know when it's in India, maybe in second year, if you, you open up your favorite quantum mechanics book, okay? And the first tutorial is about uh, the harmonic oscillator in a potential well of given size, okay? 
So you have this harmonic, you have this constraints at the edges, and you have to look at the energy spectrum of the harmonic oscillator in a well of a given size. And remember the solution to that? There's no energy continuum, but only discrete frequencies to solve it, okay? The, the, the harmonic oscillator cannot take any, any possible frequency, will only oscillate at certain frequencies. And this is so important. This is why the power trap is so important because you can have what you do, you have a harmonic potential and you trap a particle net in a well of given size. It's you who will give the size, okay? You can, you can choose the size of your trap and choose the size of your potential by just, by just engineering the parameters you want, okay? If you do that, then you will have a discretization of frequencies because the harmonic oscillator cannot take all the frequencies at once, okay? There's a discretization of frequencies. And this is the important point in the, in, in the radio frequency, in the radio frequency trap, because it can, you can only have certain energy levels and not have a continuum. And this is the, the main reason why the, this trap is used for atomic clocks, for example, because you can split up your energy spectrum, you will get rid of the Doppler continuum of frequencies, um, if and only if you can fulfill this condition, okay? So this is the main point, and this is why this will, will condition things that we will talk about later. This will condition things about how we talk about clocks, how we can design the trap, because the, the point we will go to, how we will design our quantum information experiments, okay? Because the point we want to get to is to fulfill this condition and to have the discretization of frequencies, which is built in the trap, okay? Which is a built-in property. It has been easy in the early days of the iron trap, because in the early days of the iron trap, um, the, the, the clocks we were talking about were microwave clocks. And if you talk about a microwave wave clock, the, the important dimension in that is the wavelengths of that you're, that you are probing. And in microwave, the wavelength is like centimeters, okay? So as long as your trap is smaller than the wavelengths, you're always in this strong confinement range, okay? It gets much harder if you work on optical clocks where your wavelengths, where your critical wavelength is below the micrometer, okay? So if you want to get to something which is below the micrometer, fulfilling the strong confinement condition, then this is much tougher, okay? But microwaves are easy. So if ever you have the opportunity to work on microwaves, it's an, it's an easy solution for iron trap. You will always, almost always be in this strong confinement regime um, because your wavelength is much larger than the iron trap you're building. And so no issue. Um, well, everything I said is on the slide, okay? <laughs> uh, so the, what I said, it's, what's important is that we, we have to look for, in order to reach the strong confinement regime, we have to look at the amplitude of motion of this harmonic oscillator we're looking at, of this trap, uh, that particle we're looking at, is smaller than something which is the size of the wavelength or a bit below, okay? Normally we say lumber over two pi. And then we will have a discrete spectrum and get rid of that Doppler broadening, which is uh, something which is uh, very important for, uh, for all this precision spectroscopy thing. And um, in, in the trap, okay, for a given energy, um, well, this is just a just just an example value, and we can talk about values later. But this is just something that, if we want to do that in a normal trap, we need very high um, trapping frequencies. And if we need very high trapping frequencies in a real trap, we do have electrical issues, capacities, stuff like that, and so things are getting more complicated. And so uh, this is something to bear in mind is that the easy approach for clocks is to have a single ion in a very small trap, okay? This is the things where you can technically have the best approach. And if ever you wonder why all the traps are so small, well, ions are small, okay? So you can have a small trap, but um, it, it's, also, it's also for these reasons that we want to go to the strong confinement room. Okay, so, but 
if we talk about single particles, I said single particles are the, the thing that we want to go to, okay? And if we talk about individual particles, um, I mean, looking at an individual atom is not something which has always been evident. I mean, for many people that was like, even for Schrodinger, that was something which was unimaginable. He said, well, we never experiment with single particles. Never, ever. It's, I mean, we don't raise dinosaurs. It's, it's nothing that we can easily go to. And he said, we never experiment with single electron or atom or molecule. It, it, it does not happen, but well, it does. Well, it did happen after Schrodinger, but, but as you see that physics progresses and there are things we cannot imagine today and well, there are people who make them happen. And so it, it's really, uh, it, it's really um, very interesting also to see that how much things we learn, we think that they are giving, given choices, but sometimes you can also go around and go further than that. So uh, this is the first, the first ever experiment with a single line. It was in the 1980s and was made in Heidelberg in Peter Toshak's group. And, um, and this was, at the time that was in the 1980s, it was amazing. Look at a single atom. How can you look at a single atom? I mean, for many of you, maybe today that's uh, normal, but still, it's if you do that in your lab, I still find it very, very impressive. Uh, looking at a single atom. So how do you know what a single atom is? Because if you have a, just a luminous dot like that on your camera screen, it can be everything. It can be a thousand ions, it can be a million ions. It's just maybe that your optics is not very good and you just see a blob, you just see a luminous blob. How can you, how can you be sure that this is a single line? And in fact, if you, you can, there's a way to look at a single line. If it, this is one of, this is just a generic ion you see. And this is something, this is a typical structure, typical energy level structure of the ions we use for all these precision spectroscopy terms. Well, there are other ions, but this one has, you see a strong transition where it can laser cool, maybe a smaller one, which is uh, which you have to repump, but you can just put on your laser cooling laser and then look at the, the ions, the photons which are scattered and you have a nice uh, little blob like that, okay? So if you have a metastable state like my ion has here, you can put up another laser um, which you use for probing and the, as this lifetime is very long, okay? This is a very long lifetime. It's decoupled from the rest of the system. So uh, this lifetime is very long. You can, you can excite this, this, um, th this transition. And as this, one, this lifetime is a second, okay? So what will happen if I excite my single ion to this state? If I do this, then there will be no blue photons scattered anymore. They will just disappear. And after a while, the, 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 there will be de-excitation to the ground state and will resume this scattering of blue photons on this cooling and pumping line. And so what we see is what we call quantum jumps. So we have blue photons, which are scattered, and then the ion is in the, in the metastable state and there are no photons scattered and will come back and scatter blue photons and go up there. And, and so these are quantum jumps. And this is the fundamental tool of whatever we use in single particles today. If we use, if we're working on qubits, if we're working on clocks, what we do is we're working with these quantum jumps in order to tell us if there is an ion, if it has made a transition, if it is, uh, has been done what we asked him or her to do, uh, if, if, um, if it will come back to the ground state or if it, lo if it is lost, okay? And so um, there's quantum jumps of a single ion are the basic tools of interrogating uh, the ions if we doing laser spectroscopy in the clock. Okay, so uh, so this is the the introduction about the Paul trap. How can we go to what is the operation? How can we go to single particles? Um, but just to re to sum up some of the key points is as I said, we can trap all charge to mass ratios in order by choosing our trap, by designing our trap, by choosing trap parameters. We have a simple setup, and of course it's in vacuum. Uh, we have um, a frequency of motion that we can calculate, we can simulate the behavior of the, 
of the of the ion or the ions in the trap we can store for hours and we can single, have single particles and so everything is really really works out very nicely and there are i would say two difficult points for the application is one is like i said before there's a driven motion of the ions in the trap which can pollute things and also the trap i've shown you you see the trap i've shown you this is a trap which has no holes it just has two end caps and a ring and when you want to introduce your particles you want to create some particles so how do you get in there so what is the real trap that we are building is that the one i've shown you or can it, how can i get in my laser in there and so i will talk a bit about the real ions in the trap and how that real world ions in the trap is um is uh, is behaving oh and i'm i'm always too slow i'm sorry <laughs> i will speed up a bit i will try to speed up a bit so putting ions in the trap normally well I, I i introduced the single ions as the concept you've seen how that works we'll come back to that but normally if you create ions in the trap you create more than one ion okay uh, you have like a bunch of ions you have a cloud of ions or a cloud of whatever positrons or electrons or you have a, a cloud of charged particles in the trap and if you have a cloud of charged particles in the trap there will be coulomb repulsion okay and so there will be also what we call space charge effects because if you have a cloud of charged particles there will be change, space charge and that will limit the ion density to certain values okay you cannot put infinite you cannot put an infinite number of ions in the trap because they will all repulse each other they're all charged the same way and so that will limit the ion density and as that will behave as a as a whole um as, as you look as an, uh, an electric field in a certain sense in your trap that will uh, have an, an an influence on the electric field so it will shift the frequencies of motions to lower values and it will also distort the um the, the behavior of the trap okay but um, you can, so uh, I will step through different things of different points that, we, that, um, that you have to take care of if you work about the trap. So one is space charge effect. The next one, or maybe the major one, I should have started by that, all the ion trappers know that, is the driven motion and what we call the radio frequency heating, okay? Radio frequency heating is the fact that if you are uh, trapping in an oscillating electric field, and uh, and you have all, always collisions between uh, your ions or ion neutral collisions because even if you have if, well if you're in cryo you're at 10 to the minus 17 millibar if you're in normal vacuum that 10 to the 10 10 to the minus 10 millibar but 10 to the 10 minus 10 millibar is still collision per um, a collision uh, a collision per more less than a minute i forgot uh, it's it's well you can calculate that it's it's 10 to the minus 10 millibar is not the absolute void so you still have a certain number of collisions and so what it does if you have these collisions between the ions and ion neutral collisions is that ions can gain energy in the electric field okay so what you we call that radio frequency heating is that that there are collisions of the ions in in that trap and and they will pick up energy okay and so you iron it that you have prepared carefully in the center of the trap and a cold iron if you do nothing about it um, it will just heat up after a while because there's radio frequency heating that can be collisions um, and and it will just uh, get hotter and hotter and this is something where, uh, where we really have to care for because it will it will have an influence on the condition of operation let me give some in introduction about how the ion trap really for cloud of ion works uh, if i say cloud of ion of course you always understand cloud of electrons or cloud of whatever anti-hydrogen ions or cloud of proteins cloud of charged particles so if we have an ion cloud there have been measurements made to see how that ion cloud is really how that looks like in the trap okay very early uh, in Günther Wertz group there has been a measurement of the ion distribution and they've seen that the these ions and trap they may have a wonderful gaussian distribution in the trap well a wonderful a nice gaussian distribution in the trap. Okay. and there have been uh, simulations by kepler uh, already oh, sorry early in the um, 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 sorry uh, and you see that if you have 
an an iron trap, which is, I would say, without cooling, just a trapped iron trap. Okay, I, I should say something. Um, a, an, a cloud which is trapped in a trap without any cooling mechanism, okay? Just the normal trapping. Normally we say that the iron cloud approximately has an energy of, let's say, a tenth of the potential well, okay? You can have potential wells with, I, I should have given some numbers, a normal potential, well, normal potential, uh, depending on the trap, a, a 3D trap, like the ones I've shown in the first sense, they can have a potential well, a potential well of uh, 10 to 100 electron volt. Okay, compare that, uh, has Anders talked about cold atom trapping? Yes, or oh, somebody has certainly talked about cold atom trapping. Uh, so if you have a light trap, you normally have potential wells which are much below an electron volt. An iron trap has a potential well which is an electron volt or beyond, okay? A 3D trap has a potential well depth of the order of, let's say, 50 electron volts or 30 to 50 electron volts. If you go to smaller traps, you still have something which is of the order of the electron volt, okay? So you see that you can easily trap an anion which you create at the temperature, at the normal temperature, even if you think about the ion quotation process, will can give some energy to that. But you can trap ions at room temperature. You don't have to cool them. You just trap them. You don't have to cool them. Okay. And you normally say that in a trap, the ion has an energy of a tenth of the potential well. And and one of the rules of some is that we say an ion, a trap has a with, if you don't touch it, you just have the trapping potential has an energy of an electron volt. An electron volt is lots of Kelvin, if you know that. Huh? So it's not it's not very cold at the beginning. So it's it has a it, it has really uh, uh, an energy of approximately uh, or a fraction of an electron volt, and your potential well is ten times deeper normally. Okay. Yes. 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 Yes, it is. This is. How do you handle that? How do you handle that? Normally, what we do for the precision experiments is we laser cool the ions. I will come back to that later. Okay. This is just the the the, the, the we just I, I will just discuss the first the operation of the trap, but there are ways to cool them that normally we do laser cooling, but can cool the ions with the buffer gas also. There are different ways, and there are different ways to cool the ion, I will come back. But normally there is, as you said, it's like 10,000 K, the temperature. So the, 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 the energy is of, the, of the trap charge particle is non-negligible. If you look at, at the energy, at the distribution, at the energy distribution, of the, the, the ion, or sorry, if you look at the density distribution of the ions in the trap, you will see that for hot ions, this is a simulation by Kepler, for hot ions, 10,000 K, you will have a sort of a Gaussian distribution, things that Wirt has measured it in, uh, in uh, Paul trap, okay? If you go to colder, if you go to colder uh, ions, if you cool them by any means, be it by a laser or by a buffer gas or something else, um, your density distribution will become flatter, and you see, and for cold ions, this is 10K, you can even be colder, but for cold ions, the density distribution in the trap is flat, okay? This is the, if you can say, this is the trap edges, and so the, the density distribution is really flat. You just pull up your trap. It's not the Gaussian distribution anymore. It gets flatter in your and this is just a, a just to give you an overview also in the stability diagram as things that have been made also in the early days of the ion traps looking at the stability diagram you will see that there the, the maximum number of ions which which is trapped is around a certain value which is just has been simulated in or has been calculated in the trap and you can really see where do i go if i want to optimize the number of ions in my trap if I want to work with a certain number of ions. So now how can I 
really characterize my trap and see also if the trap works the way I've designed it, okay? So I've talked to you about the frequencies of motions of the ions in the trap, and these frequency of motions can be measured. Okay? We can measure them, we can measure how the ions behave in the trap, and there are different ways to measure the frequencies of the ions in the trap. And measuring the frequency in the trap of the ion of a particle in a trap is something which is important, not only to know your trap, but also in, for some of the applications. And I will talk about that in a moment. Okay, so we can just, what we can do if we want to characterize the, 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 if we want to characterize our traps, we can look at where are the different frequencies of motion. And there is, for example, uh, there's an experiment, which is also already over 20 years old, which is an experiment which has also made, be made in mind. Um, where they looked at the stability, you see the stability diagram and you see that the black hat is the more ions you will find. So this is the maximum of the ions. But you see there are also some of these very um, white lines in the stability diagram where there's almost no ions. And what does it mean if there are always no ions? That means that um, the, the frequency of motions do couple of the different ions if you have more than one ion. So you will couple the frequency of motion of the ions in the trap, and they will just they, they can be nonlinear resonances, and you will lose your ions due to the coupling of a number of ions in the trap. So the stability diagram which I showed you is not as nice and flat as it's simulated, but the fact that you have more than one ion, there can be coupling of the ions in the trap, and you can look at nonlinear resonance. And there has been sort of number of um, work around these nonlinear resonances, which can be nicely described in the trap. And I will not go into details for that, but just to tell you that, as I said before, the stability diagram is different for every charge to mass ratio. And so you can use these nonlinearities in order to make mass filtering once again, because you can just have a very nice fine tuning in your trap and approach one of these nonlinear resonances, which is maybe nonlinear for certain E over M, but not for the one which is slightly different. And you can use that for mass filtering. What you can also do is to measure those uh, emotional frequencies. You can just tickle the frequencies, uh, the, the ions a bit. So what we say, what do we do when we say we tickle the ions? That means we give, we put on additional very tiny frequency on the ion trap, okay? Just we, we, we put that in our ion trap, okay? And what happens then is that the ions are, can pick up the ions which are in resonant with that frequency, they can pick up energy. And if you, if you put in a large amplitude, they can be ejected or they can just be, um, they can just be heated, okay? And this is a way to um, visualize the emotional frequencies in a trap. Okay, we can see, we can do that by ejection. So this is a very old slide from my thesis, that's long time ago, where you can just eject the ion and look at the, at, the, at the frequencies of the ions in the trap. We can do that also with on, on ion clouds. You see on this nice ion cloud here, it's just, it's not lost, it just, it just excited a tiny little bit and then it will, you will just see it disappear and comes back uh, when you tune your frequency over the resonance. Um, there are other ways to look at the, at the emotional frequencies. And one of the techniques which is a lot used, and I will talk about it also tomorrow for the panning traps. This is a technique which is used in pile traps and in panning traps is that we have a moving charge particles, a moving charge, and the moving charge will induce an image current on the end cap, okay, on the, on the electrodes. And so this moving charge can be monitored and, and it will give us an idea of what the emotional frequency in the trap is. And always the idea, and that will be in particular tomorrow when I talk about the experiments in the panning trap, what's very important is looking at these emotional frequencies can be done with a very extremely high precision. And we can look at mass differences with a really high precision. And this is the basic for some of the most fundamental um, um, fundamental spectroscopy experiments that I will, I will talk about, okay? So this is really something which is important, being able to measure the frequency of um, the particle in the trap. 
And so we can do that either by, by looking at ejection or by looking at image currents or uh, this is another image current. Yes. Yes. The, 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 yes, yes. So the, the, of course, this is, uh, if you look at, if you look at these things that you have always the, 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 the iron moving over the whole trap, which is not true at all. Huh? The, the, the iron is moving just around the very small magnetic field lines. So no, n normally, well, it depends on how you design your trap on what is, what is the parameter used. But normally we say that if you want to be, uh, if you want to be able to have a, um, um, a behavior of your trap, which is not taking into account all the th things at the edges, you try to design your trap that the cloud is small, the cloud or the motion of the cloud is smaller than a tenth of the trap size. Okay. Yeah, but th that's a good question because on, on these slides, we always have uh, things which are a bit schematic and it's not, it's certainly not as large as that. Okay. Detection of um, image currents, and I will go not go into that. I will just skip that. Okay. So if we have, because it's already uh, noon. So, uh, so if we if we now go to the real traps, as I said before, this is the principle of operation of the traps. But but we want to put many things in there. We want to shoot in positrons or whatever. We want to have. Um, we want to have. Um, lasers in there, we want to put microwave in there, we want to create our own. So how do we do? We have to make a lot of holes in our trap setup and we have uh, to try to put things in there. You see that the original device, even though this is very neat and there's the equipotential surfaces and we can calculate the motion and that's just, everything is perfect. That's very nice, but it's not very practical, okay? Because we want to have, uh, we want to put things in there and so we want to make holes in there. And of course, if we make holes in there, the, the it does not behave in the same sense huh? and 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 this is and by the way this is a very good transition there that normally we try also to have um our our ions or I, our ion cloud uh less than a tenth of the size of the trap so in order to be able that all the effects which are at the edges of the trap and all the 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 non-linearity is far away from the Okay, the first thing um, going to a more open configuration has been going back to the roots because uh, Paul's first idea was to have a mass filter and this is the, the image of a mass filter, which is uh, something which is also what you have in all your residual gas analyzers today. So you see this is the, the, the cross section is the one of the Paul trap, okay? But the mass filter is made of four rods and you can just uh, bring your ions in there and the trajectory of the ions will be depending on what their what, of the potential you apply there okay and if you see that if you have this trap not the 3d trap we talked about before but you have this this trap which where the cross section is the one of the pole trap you will see that the interesting thing in there is you have not only like in a 3d trap one point where the potential is zero but you have a whole line of points where the potential is zero, okay? You can go along these rods and at every cross section, there is a center point and the potential line zero is along the trap. And this is one of the, this is one of the traps which is most used today for different applications uh, in different senses, okay? In, in four different things. You see the, the idea of that would be to have an inner trapping part, to have some outer electrodes where you can, put the DC voltage. So in order to, to, to um, prevent ions to flow out at the sides, but you can have uh, ions come in, oops, sorry, ions come in um, between the rods. You can have your laser on the axis. You can have a laser beam, which is going through. And there's a very nice uh, potential of, that, uh, of this linear trap. And it's used for many applications. There are different configurations. Uh, Michael Griffin has made a different segmented trap where you have only the inner part of trapping and some larger outer electrodes. This is also for edge reasons, but I will go through that very quickly. 
No, it doesn't want. Um, the, the, the one one uh, comment about the linear ion trap, you see it has not the same R squared equals two Z squared uh, configuration as the 3D trap, but it has the R, the, only the R squared. It has only the, the, the section of the trap. So the stability diagram is a bit different. Uh, it's a bit more, um, it's the stable region is a bit more symmetric. So it's it's slightly different from the, uh, from the uh, from the original um, stability diagram, and there's one point which has to be taken into account because, as I said before, in the in the normal classical trap, you can also calculate that, or you can follow the motion of the particles very nicely because you have these equipotentials. Uh, but most of the traps which are made today are traps which are made of rods, and these rods are not hyperbolic. No? They are spherical, and so you can have you can have you have to you choose your geometry in a certain way in order to be as close as possible to quadrupole field that you can really go and, and design your trap in the in in the best way. Um, okay, and what what's important in these traps, as I said before, is you will have a line of zero potential along the along the center of the trap. And this is why this trap is very interesting. This is a slide from David Lucas uh, from Oxford. You will al already see along the line of this, the zero potential line of the trap, you can really have laser cooled uh, a string of ions and you can really have them individually separated, individual access to the trap um, and, and a very open trap configuration where you can really look at the ions, you can shoot in your lasers, and you can um, you can have these strings along the zero potential. And if I show this picture, I have to mention Sadik's trap, which is even more open with the wires where the where the rods are limited, are very very small, and the trap is very open. And if you want details, just ask me. <laughs> okay. And what we can do in these traps is we can do in these linear traps, we can do wonderful things. If we laser cool them, and I will not come, I trust that laser cooling has been treated here. So if we can cool them, if we cool the ions to very low temperatures, then the ions will crystallize. And of course they will crystallize and the, the, the shape of crystallization will depend on the shape of the potential. And if we do that in a linear trap, we can have these strings of ions which can either be very long this is one of the strings from the Innsbruck group there are you can have short traps and you see you can um you can address individual ions and make your quantum register by using if you want to use them for quantum information and by the way i should have i should have also remarked that i said there's coulomb repulsion between the ions they're not very close and the distance between ions typically is of the order of a few micrometers, okay? So that is that depends on your potential. If your potential is very open, they will be spaced more than a few micrometers. If you can have a potential which you close a bit more and then they come close together, but normally it's like something which is about a few micrometers. And you see, you can, for a few micrometers, for a beam in the, in, in for a beam of normal laser light, you can, you can focus on individual lines, you can address individual lines in these fields and you can by that technique, make these quantum registers like uh, um, this example. And you can have, have also already larger crystals in that. And these larger crystals, they can be with different species al already. And you can have, you can form these very nice structures of crystals in the top. Yes. Sorry. Uh, I will I will come back to to the ion chain. There is Dubin's theory about uh, how to. I I think it will be a couple of slides. Um, if you put in a string and and you start piling up ions, then if you have a certain potential of a limited size, but you put ions in there, then your string will, it's like if you have a string and you will squeeze the potential, your, your string will deform, it will just pile up. It will, will be squeezed together. And you will see these things here, which goes from a potential, a very first an ion string. And if you still put up, 
bring together your uh, ramp up your potential walls then the ions will be squeezed more and more together and will they will try to form to spiral okay they will try to form something which is first um something um uh, something which you have the impression that there's zigzag structure but when you pile them up more you will see that it's just a spiral form it's just a, an adn like shape which a helix structure which is formed um uh, if you if you bring together your potential walls and you can also if you have many many ions you will have uh, different shells of ions also uh, in your crystal okay you cannot only have just a string but if you put in more ions then there will be shells formed around that string and these shells they can really um you can really nicely look at them also um with uh with the many optical means we have uh, there has even been a project which has been larger than that to have an even larger ring uh, with a with a circumference of 30 centimeters to have a large iron ring in order um, to have also um, like a mini accelerator shape. Uh, this is something which I trust has been abandoned today because it's very difficult technically to um, to put into place in, in the lab. And I will make also a brief discussion about multiple traps because if we talk about the Paul trap, the Paul trap is the 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 simplest form of a multipole trap. Okay, we can put in more rods in that multipole. Okay, we if we have these linear trap, uh, these lin this trap with the four rods. Okay, we can put in more rods uh, and have different uh, and and put up uh, a different potential and this is the the pseudo potential or the potential for uh, a multipole trap okay with a number of um, of 2k rods okay so here we have k is 4 so this is the octopole trap and you go to you can also build a hexapole trap which is more difficult to describe okay let's, see. let's talk about the 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 uh, the higher pole trap so what are the higher pole traps um they are they have different dynamics as i said the the, the radio frequency is really the basic thing the, the most simple trap we have and it has stable trajectories we can describe them by Mathieu equation we have a Mathieu parameter so we can really see where the trajectories are stable if we go to higher pole traps the the dynamics of the particles is non-linear uh, we don't have these exact stability criteria we are sensitive to initial conditions and they're more complicated but what they do have is they have one main advantage uh, i will not say that what th what they do have is th they have a different density distribution and they, they have a different potential and this is why they're interesting uh, we looked at that before i told you that in the quadrupole a hot ion cloud has a gaussian distribution huh? this is the half of the gaussian distribution distribution and if you go to colder temperatures uh, there will be a flat distribution okay in in the quadrupole in the multiple trap you have a pseudo gaussian distribution for a hot ion for a hot cloud and then if you go to lower temperatures ions are pushed outwards okay they're pushed to the walls you see this 300k there there's a small maximum there and if you go to to very low temperatures they even pushed more to the walls okay and so what you can imagine that if you have a very low temperature ion cloud in a multiple trap you can think of having an ion tube for example okay having a different structure and having an ion tube a tube is just a 2d rolled on sheet okay you can make a tube like that and you can look at crystalline behavior in traps like that and so this is why this is interesting and the second thing why this is interesting is that if you whoop, if you look at the if you look at the potential well as i said before the quadrupole trap has an harmonic well okay and the thing you remember is the further you get from the center the higher will be the amplitude of motion and the amplitude of micro motion and if you have a multiple trap you see the higher the the pole number is 
the flatter will be the potential, okay? If you have a 16 pole or a 20 pole, you have a very flat bottom and the potential is like that. It's more like a, it's a well, which is, it's getting flatter and flatter in the center. So you have, you really get rid of the micro motion in the center because your potential is really flat in the center and you can have a number of ions which are exempt from micro motion in that trap, okay? This is why this trap um, is used uh, more and more in, um, in, 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 for example, uh, by our colleagues who work on cold collisions, they're using this trap because it has a very low amount of micro motion, okay? So in all this, in the people from, Dieter Gerlich has been the person who has initiated those, and if you want to know why this is 22 pole and not 20 pole, you can ask me at the coffee break. Um, but there are many people who are working on these cold collision uh, experiments who are working with these kinds of trap because they get rid of the micro motion. And so this is the interesting part just to sum up is that you can have less RF heating, you can have, uh, you can form these different structures, which is, which is, which is interesting, um, but um, you will have to, to adapt your trap and your, your experiment to that. So uh, just to give you an example, because we have been working on that and we have been setting up an octopole uh, and uh, you can see very nice and large strings in these octopoles. But the, the problem of that is that if you look at it really is that um, it's extremely difficult to have a perfect octopole, okay? Most of the time you have, if you have a distortion of 10 to the minus three on the spatial dimensions of the octopole, then the octopole becomes a number of different quadrupoles. And so that's very nice to look at long strings. It's not an octopole in itself, but it, you can look at other things. So we are setting my group, there's an effort to set up a real octopole, but this is not, uh, this is something which is technically more complicated, but we can look at extremely long strings and looking at very long strings in, in, in such an experiment, our trap is like 120 millimeters long. And if you look at the inner part, you can look at really a, a, a long, very long iron strings, okay? And I will not go to the technical details. No, 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 no. I, I did not want to go. And, but if you look at these, at these very long iron strings, uh, you can look at, as you said before, what your question was before, looking at the uh, how are the, these ions distributed in 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 your in your string, which is interesting for a number of uh, of applications. In particular, if you look at these um, very long strings, which are used for quantum information, and what you want to look at is you want to have to be in a regime where the nearest neighbor distance is almost constant. And if you have a very long string, then you can have that in the center because normally in a potential well, in a normal harmonic potential well, the nearest neighbor distance is just constant for the, let's say the, the innermost ions. And if you have a string, which is of 10 ions, already the outer ions are further away, okay? So the long, if you have a very, very large long trap, you can work on that. And there is a very nice um, uh, theory by uh, Dan Dubin. Uh, Dan Dubin, who has worked a lot in, in these charged particles dynamics. And uh, you can see that you can really describe um, the local density, the number of ions per unit length with that th theory. And you can derive the smallest inter ion distance. And so um, we can really follow up uh, the, the dynamics of these ions in the trap and look at how these ions behave. Sorry, this is maybe, uh, this is more things that, that tell you about that Dubin's theory works very nicely for the ions in the trap. That can, we can really work with an equidistant, with a large number of equidistant ions in the trap, which is, as I said before, uh, very interesting for a number of applications, in particular in quantum, in quantum information and that can be very nicely controlled. Um, just to, I think I have to finish there because we have time for a couple of questions. Just to have, to give you a, a, a one last example of how to use an iron trap. So you've seen the rod traps and, and the, the, the things that 
we can use, but you can you can just build an iron trap also for um, for if you want to use that for your outreach classes, for example, for experiments, you can use a paper clip and trap there. People who trap ions in a paper clip, you can, well, normally the ions you trap then are dust particles or macroscopic particles. You can use other things like this must be something from the workshop. So uh, you can really make very nice experiments where the ions are trapped in a ring structure of whatever size you want with the 50 Hertz apply to that. And if you do that in air, you have the advantage that there's the viscous drag of the air, which will cool the particles. And if you're lucky, you can even see some very nice crystals. If you make large particles, you can really look at that very nicely. And if you want to do that, it's, it's really good, a good experiment to show to, 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 show to the large public. It, show, it tells you a lot of the dynamics of what's a trapped particle. Uh, and just to finish, and I, I think that tomorrow we'll go into micro traps, but just to finish about going to smaller traps, uh, as I said before, uh, the, the, what we, our aim for fundamental precision spectroscopy is, go, is to work with individual lines. I've showed you the, 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 the examples of the, of the linear traps, uh, but the, the main idea is if we want to work um, with individual lines and be able to localize them nicely, to manipulate them, to address them individually, we have to go to small traps. And one of the reasons is a real, is a technical reason that if we want to really, to be able to reach the strong confinement regime and get rid of the Doppler broadening, for example, then we need high emotional frequencies. And in order to have high emotional frequencies in the trap, we need high trapping field. And if you have a high trapping field, like if you want to have a 25 megahertz and a stable condition like 1000 volts or 2000 volts, you cannot apply that for capacity reasons. You cannot apply that to a macroscopic trap. So you have to apply that to a small trap. And the smaller your trap is, the smaller are the voltages you need. And so what people do today is they're working with, for this reason and for other reasons, which, will, which I'll introduce tomorrow, is they're working with really microfabricated um, traps in order to be able also to use, for example, computer controlled um, voltages, because that allows you to really go to, to have low frequencies and to go to small structures in order to be able uh, to control everything very nicely. The first step before going to microfabricated has been to go to miniature traps. That means traps of the order of a millimeter. These traps come in different forms. Uh, they are not Paul traps with the hyperbolic forms anymore. They're reduced traps. What we can say is that in the center of the trap, the motion of the ion is still approximated by the equations of motion. So we can still have a good idea of what happens. Uh, it's not the perfect Paul trap, but it, 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 it's not far from it. And we can have traps which are only end caps or only a ring. And so there have been different traps set up in order to work just on a done on single ions um, uh, and uh, in in order to be able to go to very high trapping frequencies and to fit that into the trap. Okay, and I think I will and there okay, I will stop on this. This is one other example of a different ion trap is. If you want to look in your trap, you want to have as many photons as you, as, as much photons as you can get. And so there's a trap, which is a reduced mini trap, I would say, a trap, which is only half of the trap, only one half of the trap. And, and uh, so in order to trap an ion, and which has a, which I call the four pi trap, which has a very open configuration uh, to, to have a very large optics and look at everything which is going on. And so, um, sorry. And so I will, um, yeah, this is approximately where I thought I would go. So I will, uh, tomorrow I will, I will just finish on that by showing you a number of microfabricated traps and why that's interesting to work on and what, why that's interesting for precision spectroscopy. And then I will go into the panning trap details, panning traps, which are, used today much in very fundamental experiments, often without 
the laser, but with other techniques. And I will I think I will go through a number of experiments on the panning trap side. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Martina, for this uh, excellent introductory talk on iron trapping. Uh, questions, students. Are you trapped? Please get out of the traps and ask questions. Uh, they're cooled completely now, <laughs> almost. No, uh, I had a question. So is there any cutoff frequency for trapping? Sorry, could you speak in the mic better? Yeah, so is there any cutoff frequency for like this side. to trap Any cutoff? Ah, how high can you go? Below you can go. Whatever you can do. I mean, that's, uh, it's, there are people who are, uh, the, the, the main, the, the, the main problem with the frequency is the vacuum feed through. So the, the, the problem is that there are some technical issues, okay? The, the, the problem is that all traps are in vacuum and some, some are in cryo, okay? And normally your, your, your generator is outside the vacuum and vacuum feed through is something which is limiting a lot the frequency you can, you can get in, okay? So uh, due to capacity reasons, a vacuum feed through is, has a high capacity. It's, it's, uh, it's something which is, um, it's a conductor, an isolator, and then you have your flange, okay? So that's the capacity. And so um, there has been one experiment in the NIST group 20 years ago, where they had put their, um, their resonating circuit in the vacuum and put in the frequency with an antenna. And they went to um, 120 megahertz, I think. Who's there? Who knows better? I think it was 120 megahertz trapping frequency. But for practical reasons, I did not continue. So, so many of these traps today, they're between 20 and 40 megahertz trapping frequency, um, approximately. Thank you. Any any other students first? Okay, so there's one. Sadik, you to wait. Let's let's ask the students to. Sadik. Hi, hello. Uh, so my question is: Is BEC is possible with the ions? Uh, both BC Einstein condensation. BEC, BEC. Um, what did I tell about driven motion and micro motion and things that it's difficult to get rid of? I think that. If you would put your BEC in the trap, it would be immediately destroyed by micro motion. So okay. that is, uh, <laughs> I think how, this is not very practical. So how did you get to that temperature? That low Normally temperature? we do laser cooling and simple laser cool, simple Doppler cooling is sufficient in the iron trap because if you Doppler cool and go to the strong confinement regime, you don't need to cool any lower, okay? Because what we want to, what, what's important in, in ion traps is we want to get rid of the Doppler effect, okay? The Doppler effect is first order Doppler broadening. That's important, okay? That's, we get rid of that. And I think that maybe Fritz has talked about that and or Tanya will. We have what we call the second order Doppler effect, okay? Which is a relativistic effect. And there you want to go to very low temperatures. But in general, this is not the major contribution in an error budget. And so normally, normally in most of the traps, simple Doppler cooling is sufficient. There is an approach of Sisyphus cooling to go to lower temperatures. But for the, for the majority of applications, Doppler laser cooling is, is of use. Thank you. Okay, uh, so one more student I think who had raised hand uh, and then the two <laughs> seniors. Uh, hello, uh, thank you for the excellent talk. So um, I do not know much about uh, the experimental uh, uh, implementation of the trap dines, but uh, were very naive questions. So you talked that uh, in your slide 21, you talked that the stability diagram uh, is, is different for uh, different um, ions. Like uh, it depends on the charge to mass ratio. Yes. So, so it kind of acts like a mass filter. 
Yes, it is. So, uh, I mean, I wanted to know, uh, I mean, what this information could, how, how, how well this information could be used uh, to, um, you know, engineer the iron traps. So I, I, I... It's used all the time. It's used all the time for, an iron, tra an iron trap is a mass filter, okay? An iron trap is a mass filter. And it, it's, it's what, the, what the normal mass separation process, which is done in these mass filters, okay? In, in many of today's um, mass spectrometers, there is a linear ion trap and ions are shooting and, and depending on the parameters, you have the different trajectory, either they come out because they're a stable solution or they will just be um, uh, um, uh, um, expelled on the electrode. What you do in, in, in a mass filter like that, okay, this is why I put the, what we call the apex, the, the highest point here, okay? You see that can be very specific for a single ion, okay? So if, and, and you can move through the stability diagram by just, by just A and Q are dependent of the static voltage you apply and of the amplitude of the oscillating field, okay? So you can ramp through there by just, very by tuning the applied voltages okay so if you you have an ion you don't know the mass but you can ramp through there and see if the ion is still in your in your trap okay so if you ramp through there and your ion for example is this mass okay you go to 20 volts here and you go to uh, to 150 here you know that and the, the ion is still here there then you know that the mass is higher than something which is M over E sixty eight or something like that. Okay, or you can even go. You can go to higher voltages here. And if you're if the ion is still present here, then you know that you are in this mass range. Okay, and so it's used as a real mass filter. And many of the mass um, spectrometry experiments, and I many of them are made in penning. Also, I will talk about that tomorrow. But but. Uh, the mass spectrometry experiments which are made, many of them are made within reference ion, okay? So you have a reference ion, the most, the, the most popular reference ion is used carbon-12, okay? And then you have your reference ion and you have the ion you want to measure. And you can look, for example, you measure the frequencies of motion of your reference ion and of your unknown ion, okay? And you can just calculate what is the mass of the unknown ion. So this okay. is a very popular application. And also just another question, uh, you talked about the micro motion. So the micro motion, the, yeah. yeah. So, uh, I mean, is, is it the, the source of that micro motion? Is that, is it only the driven? Uh, it's frequency? the driven motion of the trapping. Okay, nothing else. <laughs> no, that's yeah. sufficient. <laughs> okay. It's the driven motion of the trapping field and without trapping field, no trapping, okay? Mm -hmm. So, uh, and driven motion is hard to get rid of. So, so nothing else is a nice question, but that, that's still the, the main part. It's the, it's the main thing, it's a driven motion, and this is why it's so hard to get rid of. Thank you. Okay, so two quick questions, Sadiq one, and then um, Ahesh, and then we'll call it off for lunch. Hi. So if my question is not quick, we can take it at lunch. Uh, the thing is, uh, when you talked about multipolar traps, you spoke about this adiabaticity parameter, which actually shrinks, and we get into a lot of instabilities with the trapping of the ions. Do you have some insights to offer as to what is the, so basically deviation from the quadrupole is causing this, but is there a clear understanding about how much you deviate from the quadrupole in order to, to get into these instability parameters. So let's say, let me turn the question around. If I'm designing a perfect quadrupole, but obviously I do not get it, uh, how susceptible am I to this adiabaticity parameter? That's a very difficult question, Sadiq, because it depends on the, it depends on the trap you design. And it depends on the, it depends also on the scale you're looking on. I mean, if you, if you design a very perfect quadrupole trap, you will, if by some slight deviation, 
from the quadrupole uh, geometry, you will have you will add these multiple terms right? we, if, that we want always to have as small as possible, and and um, if your ions are really if your trap is really big and your ions are far away from that, you can still normally in the in the central part of the trap you can approach an ideal geometry, but the central part depends on how many ions you put in there, and and so. Um, I think there's no recipe other than like in quadrupole traps, sometimes we put in compensation electrodes, stuff like that. But uh, it's very hard to do that by design because normally when you design, you always design a perfect trap. But uh, design and, and materialization of the design are some things, things which are different. So I, I think I could not give a full answer to that question. Let's talk about that one. Okay, so Mahesh, last question and yeah. Oh, thanks for the nice lecture. So uh, I am impressed by that uh, uh, picture that you showed of 150 ions in the linear yes. trap. Uh, so if you want to do quantum universal uh, quantum computation yeah. with that, so what are the challenges? Will the addressability going to be an issue? The, the, oh, no, no, this is the important. Um, the addressability is is always an issue in a sense that this one for you now. Um, it depends on, on how you work. I mean, what what for example, in what Chris Monroe's group does, they, I mean, they're working with very long strings for quantum information, and they are uh, working not they're working about they they. They, they have made some work about swapping ions in the string, for example, okay? So that you be able, because the, the ions at the end of the string, they're always easier to address than the ions in the center of the string, okay? But what's important in these strings is that you have to, there's different dynamics of the ions which are in the center of the string and those are in the outer part. And you have to cope with those and, and make sure that the different dynamics will not pollute your coherent dynamics, but but um, these large strings, I think these very large strings are not interesting for individual addressing. They're interesting to, to look at other things at other dynamics to look at equidistant ions, for example, but I would not think they're interesting for quantum. Okay, so let's thank Martina again and.